Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Sarah McCaffrey and I'm the manager of interdisciplinary arts at Asia Society. Thank you so much for joining our virtual book club to discuss the next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 21st Century, hosted by Dr. Scott Kurashige. And a warm welcome to all of our returning book clubbers and all new folks joining in. And I know that we're still entering this space, um, but to sort of ground us together, we'll start by doing a collective virtual mapping of sorts, and we'll do that via the chat. And I wanted to ask you all, where are you joining in from? So if you could let us know via the chat, we can start doing that collective virtual mapping. Asia Society New York is situated on the Lenape Island of Manhattan in Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We pay respect to the Lenape peoples and also acknowledge that New York City has been a gathering spot and home for other indigenous peoples. In this time of great turmoil and upheaval, we really felt that there was a need to find grounding and inspiration and also explore potent ways of being in this world. And that led us to ancestor Grace Lee Boggs and her book, The Next American Revolution. And as Grace writes in the book, the real engine of change is never critical mass, Dramatics and systemic change always begins with critical connections. And we hope that this gathering can open up pathways for critical connections. We are thankful to our partners who share this belief and have helped expand the reach of this event. A huge thanks to our partners, Asian American Arts Alliance, Asian American Feminist Collective, Collective Resistance, and Sister Diaspora for Liberation. I also want to thank our moderators who, will you meet, uh, who you will meet later on for holding space for this community. So for tonight, we will start with a welcome from our host, Dr. Scott Kurashige. We'll then break up into smaller groups for discussion of the book. And then finally, we'll all return back here for a Q&A with our host. It's my immense pleasure to introduce our host, Dr. Scott Kurashige. Scott is professor and chair in the Department of Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies at Texan Christian University. He is the author or co-author of four books, including The 50-Year Rebellion, How the U.S. Political Crisis Began in Detroit. He served as president of the American Studies Association from 2019 to 2020. We're honored to have Scott who worked on the next American Revolution with Grace hosts this event. So tonight is an invaluable opportunity to dive into the important teachings of this text and we're excited to get started. And before I pass it over to Scott so we can hear from him, I want to ask everyone to please ensure that your mics are turned off for this portion. Okay, and with that, um, I'll pass it over to you now, Scott. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, Sarah, for that introduction. Thank you uh, to the Asia Society for hosting this event uh, and inviting me to be a part of it. Um, and thank all of you for joining. Um, I know it's a Friday evening, there's a lot going on in the world. Um, and Grace would just be so excited to see people taking the time um, to read books in general. I mean, not just, just her book. Um, but really just to recognize what she called the importance of the power of ideas. Um, and so I also wanna thank Grace and her extended revolutionary family in Detroit for making it possible um, for me to publish this book and to talk about it with you um, in a forum like this. Um, and Grace, as I uh, noted in the book, often started her gatherings with this question, what time is it on the clock of the world? Right. So she would ask everyone to think about that question. Sometimes she would like pause and make people think about it. Um, so what time is it on the clock of the world to you? For Grace, she wanted people to have what she called a sense of history, not just according to timelines or history books um, by professors, but to have a philosophical sense of where we stand in the evolution of humanity. 
Knowing where we stand then becomes a basis for challenging ourselves to do what must be done to grow our souls and advance the evolution of the human race. These evolutionary or slow protracted changes in social consciousness, values and relationships prepare us for the leap forward, the revolution we need to address the terrible crises and deeply rooted structural ills that threaten the planet and all forms of life on earth. So this is what made Grace a radical philosopher activist and what sets her apart from many on the left to define themselves, their values um, or their movements, mainly by ideology, militancy or opposition, anti-capitalism, anti-racism, anti-sexism and so on. So thus, while Grace engaged with Marxism, socialism, and other isms throughout her life and recognized their place in the relatively short history of revolution, she saw that 19th and 20th century histories, uh, 19th and 20th century histories and theories of revolution needed to be understood, appreciated, and critiqued for what they represented in their own times. Whatever old truths may have been previously discovered, these do not give us a blueprint for revolution or social action in our times. Revolution is a process to discover and create new truths. Revolution, as we say in chapter two, is a new beginning. And with each and every day of destruction under Trump, COVID-19 and plutocracy, it should be more and more apparent that we are coming to the end of an epoch. That is why our task is to make sense of the changing realities that define our time, analyze the contradictions at the heart of those changing conditions and take action to make the world anew, to remake the world anew. That's the method that Grace, drawing from Hegel, called dialect, dialectical thinking, which informs the concept of dialectical humanism as a model of revolutionary praxis. As I wrote in the introduction, we are living through a quintessential moment of crisis representing both danger and opportunity. As we think dialectically about our current predicament, there are three interconnected points I'd like to highlight at the outset today, starting at the macro or global level and moving to the level of the grassroots where change is most radical in the sense of being innovative and dynamic. So first, we are in the midst of a deep systemic crisis. Trump, and just as importantly, Trumpism, symbolized by the 80% or so of its followers, so far beyond the pale that they buy into the QAnon style lies and fabrications used to rationalize astronomical levels of corruption and fascist conduct. They've undoubtedly heightened this crisis. We have, reached the stage where pointing out that we are in a constitutional crisis in which there is no longer any widely respected governing authority independent of partisan interest or manipulation barely scratches the surface of how much we have regressed and how much further things may unravel, perhaps in rapid fashion. But Trump is as much or more a symptom of this structural crisis rather than the cause. The signs of calamity caused by unsustainable ways of living under capitalism, short-sighted thinking and priorities, dependence on fossil fuels, and the ceaseless and boundless accumulation of capital as the golden rule underlying the system have been readily apparent for quite some time. So you can see that on page one of the introduction to the book published 10 years ago, we, like many others, Grace and I, named climate change and the threat of mass extinction at the center of this structural crisis. But we also noted still on that same page one, the looming threat of pandemics and the resurgence of racism and authoritarianism, because it was clear that as the neoliberal turn devoured the relatively stable and regulated model of liberal capitalism, which still created all kinds of death and destruction on its own right, given that neoliberal turn disrupting the stability of the old order, the center was hollowing out as such um, conduct and movements that would have previously been seen as fringe or extreme were becoming more commonplace as competing social forces move toward the construction of a new system that will either be more democratic and egalitarian than this current system, or one that is even worse, that is more authoritarian and stratified than the current system. As the introduction makes clear, we need to have a clear sense of what is dying, what is growing, and what is yet to be born during this phase of transition. The conversation Grace and I had with Emmanuel Wallerstein, who also sadly passed away last year, at the US Social Forum in Detroit in 2010, um, and that can be found in the afterword if you have the paperback version of the book, really helps to explain further the forces both pushing toward the crisis and finding a way out of it. So that's point one. Point two, at the national level, the US is clearly in the midst of transformative change, first set in motion by the movements of the 1960s. There's been a general trend towards civil rights, diversity, social justice, 
and the rise of a non-white majority, along with the globalization of commerce and culture. The reaction to this has been a counter-revolutionary movement to reinforce white power, apartheid rule, and the so-called traditional culture, while maintaining social control through repression. This is the essence of MAGA nationalism. Now, Grace saw all this coming, even though she joined the ancestors in 2015, when Trump's campaign was still a joke to the mainstream media. In 2013, the crisis in Detroit epitomized the end of the liberal, reformist, and relatively stable era of global capitalism, culminating in Michigan's state government orchestrating a hostile takeover of Detroit that gave an unelected emergency manager, quote unquote, autocratic powers to cram down neoliberal austerity measures based on a corporate model of bankruptcy drawn up by Wall Street financiers to serve billionaire developers and investors. As Grace commented at the time, this was the upshot of the right-wing counter-revolution against the modest steps towards racial integration and economic leveling that liberalism had offered. Then the election of the first black president kicked this reaction into overdrive. In 2000, Grace called um, the Bush v. Gore decision a right-wing coup. She saw George W. Bush's victory as illegal, immoral, and illegitimate exposing the structural flaws and biases in the electoral systems um, and representative democracy itself. So that should leave little doubt about how she would view the current assault on the basic concept of voting rights and fair elections. And these were Grace's exact words in 2013, quote, we must join together to resist and defeat the growing counter revolution. A growing number of white people feel that as they are becoming the minority, the country is no longer theirs. They are becoming increasingly desperate and dangerous. The situation reminds me of the 1930s when so-called good Germans, demoralized by their defeat in World War I, followed Hitler into the Holocaust. Okay. So this also puts chapter three's um, writings on Malcolm and Martin into clearer focus. Martin and Malcolm were not just civil rights and black power leaders. They, in both distinct and overlapping ways, were grappling with the challenge of revolutionary transformation that, that is still in front of us today. Okay, so the third point, as with all of Grace's writings, everything only really makes sense once you see how her most radical and creative ideas are emanating from grassroots activism and community building in Detroit. This is where we highlight in the book models of two-sided transformation of ourselves and our structures, which connect Detroit to parallel movements around the world particularly indigenous movements in places like Bolivia, Chiapas, Canada, and Standing Rock. Our view of what was coming in the US was based on seeing Detroit as the proverbial miner's canary. It should come as no surprise that Trump, who singled out Detroit as the only city named in his horrendous inaugural speech on the theme of American carnage, has again focused on Detroit along with other Republican leaders as a primary target of the racist discredited allegations of voter fraud. 20th century Detroit once stood at the forefront of the social and economic advances made possible by rapid industrial development, labor organizing, and civil rights. In dialectical fashion, Detroit became a place of abandonment where those who remained were forced to imagine, to imagine new forms of survival and resistance that were necessary and possible in the wake of white flight, capital flight, and the neoliberal assault. This comes across through our discussion of the urban farming movement in chapter four and the freedom schooling movement in chapter five which since 2013 has been exemplified by the actual James and Grace Lee Boggs School, now located just a couple blocks from Jimmy and Grace's historic home on the east side of Detroit. Drawn from the Detroit Coalition Against Police Brutality, the concept of peace zones for life is especially crucial in this moment where a transformative justice response to rampant police killings must transcend empowering the state to judge and prosecute offenders. Instead, as the Detroit Justice Center advocates another uh, group connected to the Bog Center, we must dream of a future where reliance on police, prosecutors, and prisons is not needed because ongoing practices to nurture community health and well-being through solidarity make de-escalation, nonviolent conflict resolution, and restoring offenders to their communities part of a routine and daily practice to stretch humanity and transform oppressive structures. That's a good place to transition to the breakout conversations. Um, and if you're here, you likely already see what is collapsing in this system and what must be abolished. What we need, uh, what we need to move from resistance to reconstruction and from rebellion to revolution is what Grace called visionary organizing. 
that goes beyond protests and opposition to put values in practice and create models of the new systems that will elevate our humanity to uh, unprecedented heights. So I'm gonna stop there, turn it back over to the moderators. Thank you. Okay, so for the Q&A session today, um, because we are such a large group, instead of asking our questions um, with our mics, we are going to have everyone turn off their mic for this section and then ask questions via the chat. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you can click on chat. And then if you type in your questions there and make sure that um, everyone is selected so that everyone in the meeting can see your question, then I'll be choosing some questions from there and I will be posing them to Scott. And that we will do this until we wrap up the event at eight o'clock. So while you're mulling over um, your questions here, I'm going to pose one um, because we are Asia Society Museum and this event is organized as part of the inaugural Asia Society Triennial, which comprises an exhibition and a slate of virtual programs. My question um, is in reference to a line from the book that Grace writes, art can help us to envision the new cultural images we need to grow our souls. So my question is, would you elaborate on the role of art and social transformation? How does art help to grow our souls? So I'll, we'll begin there and then we'll go to questions in the chat. Okay. Um, you know, I think it starts from recognizing that um, what's wrong with the system is not just that there's inequality, right? That sort of there are haves and have nots. Obviously that's a big part of why capitalism you know, is so dehumanizing and exploitative and in some cases, you know, genocidal and parasitic. Um, but what Grace is often pointing out, and, this, and she gets this from reading, you know, the early Marx with C.L.R. James, you know, where, where, where Marx was uh, much more, um, I think, um, engaging with Hegel's idealism rather than trying to turn it on its head. The solution is not simply to have more wealth, um, material wealth, right? I mean, you can, you can think of wealth in a spiritual and a cultural sense instead of a material sense. And so if everybody just had more, then the system would work better rather than recognizing that it's the system's emphasis on that uh, focus on material wealth, right? Which leads to that sense of accumulation and competition rather than cooperation and expanding our humanity, right? That's, I think, at the core of why she sees, you know, art and culture more generally as really important as a way to create sort of a, a, a counterculture um, to, you know, to capitalist consumer culture and white supremacist, you know, uh, um, um, genocidal culture. That's a lot of the way, um, there's kind of a, there's sort of a, a radical current throughout the 20th century that pushes more in that direction. And so if you read through the Marxist tradition, people like Antonio Gramsci, even if you read, you know, Lenin and Mao in ways that people who call themselves Leninist, Leninist and Maoists don't necessarily do, um, you can see this emphasis on, on cultural growth and uh, in, in the writings on, on revolution. But then when you look more uh, in recent times, um, if you look at the writings of someone like Stuart Hall, um, and again, there's all kinds of, of artists. Angela Davis is someone, you know, we've talked about, who, who's, who's talked about the blues culture. Um, Robin Kelly, who, uh, I'll just put this, um, I'll just put this um, link in the chat to this conversation we had about Jimmy and Grace Bugg's idea on revolution with people like Angela Davis, Robin Kelly, Adrian Marie Brown, um, um, and, and Shay Howell that there has to be, um, that, the, that the solution is not simply just economic, right? Give everybody more, because then that means you need a system that's about creating more, and that's the problem in the first place, right? This need to have more um, quantity rather than quality. That the solution is not simply political, that it's not just changing leaders or, or, or who runs, uh, and oftentimes that pursuit of power, of state power, again, is, is sometimes driven by that same, 
need to accumulate power, right? Just like the need to accumulate capital and material possessions. Um, and so um, it comes from the idea that the change, the transformative change from within, you know, and with and with comes from within and, and that, that pervades throughout society has to be related to, to thinking differently, right? To, and that sense of creativity and an imagination can't come from people who are so embedded with the system that they're either, you know, the rich people trying to create, trying to get more wealth for themselves or people so, so caught up in having to just, you know, work just to survive that, that we don't have the time and space to think beyond, you know, the rat race and, and the way the system made that whole idea. Even when you win the rat race, you're still a rat, right? So I think art becomes just incredibly important in that sense of, again, having that space um, of, of what Robin Kelly calls freedom dreams, having that ability to not just to, to reflect what's what's wrong with society, but also again to imagine alternatives to it. Um, and as as Grace said, you know, the artists give us that sense of how again we're not just trying to grow our economy, but um, we need to grow our souls. Thank you for that, Scott. So our next question um, comes from Lily. How do we hold Grace's deep commitment to locality while at the same time cultivating our capacity for transnational relationships and solidarity? And I know that you touched on the idea of locality in your opening. So a follow-up question to that. Okay. Um, okay. I, I just found it in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I think this is this is very important um, because obviously we have a system that is global and transnational in scope, you know, um, and has the ability to, you know, and people in power have the ability to create destruction on a global scale, whether it's through, you know, pushing a button, you know, Lord knows what the guy with the nuclear codes is doing right now um, in this country, um, but also, you know, pushing a button that basically, you know, leads to mass extinction because of the way we are, you know, destroying um, the environment. Um, so there has to ultimately be um, a sense of scale, of global scale, right, to our movements if, if, if any of us are, are gonna survive and, and, and thrive um, in the 21st century and beyond. Um, but I think part of the problem is, um, we oftentimes, um, I mean, part of the problem with sort of liberalism in general, it was based on a false notion of universalism, right? So when we think about, you know, ideas of man, right? Or we think of, you know, of democracy or all these big concepts under liberalism, whether they're sort of moderate forms of liberalism or more radical forms that lead to socialism, they're all based on sort of assuming something was universal, so a certain experience or a subject position was universal. Like, you know, so the proletariat oftentimes meant as a universal class, oftentimes in practice meant sort of a white male industrial worker in a privileged, you know, sector of the first world, um, rather than, you know, um, again, workers in the global South, you know, and undocumented immigrants and others who just aren't as, as visible within, you know, the, the um, standard categories. So, in order to get beyond that sort of false universalism or that thinking that change is gonna come from the top down, right? Which um, certainly change can happen from the top down. It's very rarely though that sort of a revolutionary leap in humanity comes from the top down because you know it's coming from a very narrow perspective and coming from people in power. Um, so that sense of change coming from the ground up, you know, which everyone knows that, um, when we, when we think about the history of civil rights movement and so on, that change comes to the ground up, you know, Obama talked about it over and over again. Um, but those things become slogans unless they really are not just seeing people as faceless masses, right? So change from the ground up could mean you think, okay, if just millions of people demonstrate, you can get rid of, you know, uh, a tyrant in power. But it's not just, again, mass mobilization. That's that whole question of critical, critical mass versus critical connections. It's about from the grassroots, what Grace called visionary organizing, right? That at the grassroots level, at the local level, people can create models, radical models of education, 
or of cooperative housing and land ownership or of the urban farming movement, again, which starts at a very local scale. Um, and through that, um, we can, in a very horizontal sense, share these practices, establish these relationships through a web of relationships, rather than simply thinking, okay, you know, someone has a plan, okay, that person's gonna become president or that party's gonna see state power and then we'll, we'll you know, spread it everywhere. Um, that's not how transformative change happens, right? That's how, you know, change can happen that way, but not necessarily in a revolutionary transformative way. And just to follow up on that, so one second. Um, when you were saying that these sort of localized entities, they're doing the revolutionary work and then they can share their strategies and speak horizontally and create web-like forms, does that web then stretch transnationally? Like, do those, re is that how you envision transnational relationships and solidarity to take place? Yeah, I mean, it certainly can. Um, and, you know, it can happen um, through, so for instance, like the civil rights movement, again, when you get beyond these simplistic histories that focus only on the role of, you know, President Lyndon B. Johnson, or even just the role of Martin Luther King, right, and, and certain leaders, you realize that most of the truly transformative change from the civil rights movement and just the spread of the movement itself came from these horizontal web of relationships, people replicating practices like the sit-in movement, you know, um, or, you know, people converging upon Mississippi for, for Freedom Summer. Um, that also happens, I think, you know, if, if you look around the, at, at the cultural and political influence of the civil rights movement, right, you see it, you can see it reflected in, you know, the movement against apartheid in South Africa. You can see it in, you know, movements of, you know, workers in Europe. You can see it in reflected in movements of, you know, peasants in Latin America. So there's ways in which movements you know, this in some ways, I was talking to Michael Hart the other day who talked about multitude, that if we think of ourselves as, as sort of the revolutionary forces creating a multitude rather than all needing to be in one party, right? There's ways in which movements influence each other um, through, I don't want to say osmosis, but through sort of these cultural ways in which messages, and I mean, even some like Black Lives Matter, right, is, is now... Um, um, become, you know, has had influence all, all around the world. So there's ways in which that happens. And there's ways in which sometimes you do need that higher level of coordination, like, you know, when there's a war or something and we're, and we're trying to stop it, or right now in this country, you know, when there's a, when there's a president who, who's trying to overturn even just the, you know, the most rudimentary sense of democracy that we've known under capitalism. Um, and uh, that's when, right, that's when these models of coordination take on a different meaning. So you know, there's been ways in which, there's ways in which within movement building, people have looked towards, you know, this comes out of like the Battle of Seattle, looking at forming affinity groups, looking at consensus models of decision-making. There's, there's ways that, that governments have tried to scale this up through participatory budgeting. This comes in some ways out of the uh, uh, Brazilian Workers' Party uh, in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, and then some of those parties have actually taken, you know, state power on a, on a, on a on a national level. Um, Naomi Klein's written about these types of movements. Um, and so it's not that any one is like the blueprint for one party or one you know, international movement. It's that with respect to local conditions, we'll see how these grow and succeed and sometimes fail and learn from their mistakes. You know? And that is why revolution is not just, again, we sweep away all the people in power. We sweep away the system in in in, in one motion, or as one as Grace calls one D Day, you know, style event. It's going to require, yeah, that sense that things need to change urgently, but that it's going to when you're involving millions and millions of people in a participatory democratic way, it has to happen with you know changes in consciousness, changes in practices, changes in how people relate to their neighbors, to their coworkers, to their teachers, students, you know. Um, so on. Um, and, and, and that's, again, where the local, so many of those critical connections are going to happen at the local level. Um, but sometimes the ideas can connect with people, right? And the models can connect people, you know, across nations and continents and borders. Yeah, that makes sense. And 
thinking about movement building and how those webs are formed, we have a follow-up question to that. How does internet connectivity shift these formations of critical connections and activism potential in this moment? And then what continues to call for embodied presence? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny, I think, um, on the one hand, Grace saw technology in general as very destructive, that it was something that, you know, was driving capitalism and development um, for the pursuit of, you know, profit um, and creating more inequality, right, uh, of not just resources, but also of power and decision making. Um, and yet, at the same time, I think she saw dialectically, right, that there was also democratic potential and people having more access. To so, like, she got towards the end of life, like hugely, hugely, you know, into the idea of 3D printing um, and the notion that, you know, through information networks, you can actually change, give, give people like in the global south or in, you know, poor communities in the US, the means of production. So, so like there was that idea, right, under socialism that in order to create equality for the workers, the workers would have to, um, you know, um, organize, and then confront the the the, um, the the bosses, and then have enough influence over the state to where the redistribution of resources and wealth can happen. But with like three D printing, you know, or uh, uh, digital fabrication, Grace kind of idea is like, wait, you can actually just give people the means. Of, like people can practice small C communism on a local scale, you know, with these new technologies. They could build their own houses. They could build their own schools. They could, um, you know, build their own. Uh, um, um, they could just own the means of production rather than bargain with their bosses or the government for, you know, a redistribution of wealth. So I, I think she, you know, again, she tried to see what was potentially liberating um, and what was also dangerous. Um, and I, I, I think that's the case, you know, with the I mean, obviously we're, we're doing this right now because the internet makes it possible. And yet the people doing the data mining, the people doing the, you know, um, the people aggregating, you know, um, all of this wealth and power and, you know, using it to control, you know, workers, you know, in the gig economy. I mean, all of that, I think, is, is, is taking that shared, um, shared commonwealth and information that, that we can create, that we can pull together with technology and then concentrating right in the hands of a small number of, of capitalists. And if we were just, sort of exploring how to grow the web, what are its um, characteristics? What about the complications in the web and um, forming critical connections? So this next question is, how do we form critical connections when we fear? Um, when there might even be a thought that you don't want to connect with people within society because their views are so different from your own. Um, this was a question that came up from the chat. Yeah, and you know, in some ways, that's a broader question that comes up. What happens if you defund the police or you abolish the police? What do you do about people, you know, who are rapists, who are murderers, right? Um, there's always that question of, um, do we need some kind of um, power above us to contain, you know, um, the most um, odious or dangerous elements? Um, and I think the challenge is, that's why I think, again, obviously these are things that are not gonna change overnight, right? We're not gonna eliminate, um, uh, you know, militarism overnight. We're not gonna el eliminate state violence overnight, um, but um, we can have a radical change in our way of thinking, right? About what's possible, what's necessary and what's possible. Um, and that's why, again, the local work is so important because it's, it's at the local level where people actually put these things into practice. The Detroit Coalition Against Police Brutality has been working with local communities. How do you get people to have, to train youth and community leaders in de-escalation so that people don't call the police? Because so many times, and you see this over and over again, right? You know, the incidents of police brutality oftentimes and police killings happen when a family member with some kind of domestic disturbance arises and people feel powerless and they feel like they need the police. So how is, it really just starts with that sense of, how do we how do we empower ourselves as the grassroots? How do we 
how do we free our, our minds to realize that, that we have the power within ourselves, as Grace said, to make the world anew. But it can't just be an idea. I mean, I can, you know, teach classes and write books and, and, and reach people at the level of ideas, but that's only meaningful to the extent that there are some local models of people putting in the practice, right? That's, I think, why the Zapatista movement, for example, has been so inspirational to people, because it wasn't just putting out, you know, this manifesto. It was about creating um, these, a dual power society, right, where people actually would govern themselves based upon these revolutionary principles, you know, and not just have it be where we're always trying to convince the, the people running the system to implement these reforms or changes. Another question sort of related to um, seeing the um, internal agency um, came up in the chat. Um, Philip writes, I found Grace Lee Boggs' idea about victimhood super relevant um, to present day activism today. It often feels like the left and the right both feel like they're victims of the other. What would Grace say about the sense of victimhood in 2020? And how does one begin to see oneself less as a victim and more as an agent of change? Okay, thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really important, right, on a number of levels, right? And so for a long time, we have talked about the idea of minority rights in this country, right? That um, so much of, you know, when I started college, people still use the term minorities all the time, right? That there's a white majority, but in order to have the US fulfill its democratic potential, we need to have civil rights you know, for minorities. And if we start with African-Americans, we need to talk about you know, other BIPOC communities, um, um, queer communities, disabled communities, so on. Um, and so uh, Grace, uh, and, and in many ways in combination with, with Jimmy Boggs, oftentimes said, you know, it's important, like don't think like a minority. Because when you think like a minority, you reduce yourself to thinking that we can only have minority rights. And you used to think that, that it's only about having rights within the system rather than recognizing our power to create a whole new system, right? Or, or transform um, the system. So that becomes important, that idea, don't think like a minority. The other thing about don't think like a minority is um, as a minority, you can get too caught up, right? In this idea of victimhood or the notion that somehow the people in power um, thinking that the people in power are actually going to fix it. I mean, the people in power are not <laughs> going to fix the system. They're the ones profiting off the system the way it is. They may reform it from time to time because they wanted to survive for their own sake. But that's what's so different about this moment, right? That, that, that bipartisan agreement or that shared capitalist agree agreement you know, among capitalists that the most important thing is preserving the system, preserving the global capitalist system, preserving the American, you know, superpower role within that system and preserving that sense of, you know, of, of smooth functioning of it, you know, uh, domestically, like so many of, you know, the, of the trends before Trump, but particularly accelerated during Trump have, have really moved away towards the idea of preserving the system, right? It's, it's really about looting it for as much as you can now, right? And then getting ready, you know, for, for the next one. Um, so I think that's important too, that don't think like a minority, don't get, stu don't get stuck in protest mode and don't get stuck in um, victim role because really what it's about is preparing. Revolution is about people from the grassroots developing the capacity for self-governance, right? And the imagination to, to, to create a, a, a different model of governance, different model of education, a different model of, of work and production, uh, and, and law and justice and policing and so on. Um, what's so striking about this moment is the way the right wing and the Trump people and sort of huge sectors of, of, of white America have really, have really, to them, it, it's like the most important thing, right, is to declare themselves the biggest victims. I mean, Trump is like, you know, constantly stuck in victim mode. So that, that whole sense that, you know, it was previously conservatives or even some people, you know, uh, among radicals like Jimmy and Grace challenging this idea of minority grievance and, and victimhood. Now it's like Trumpism is about, no, we're claiming that we're the biggest victims. Like we're gonna constantly complain about everything. Like everything that doesn't go our way, we're gonna say was a lie and a fraud, you know. Um, 
and we're always going to blame someone else. We're going to take no responsibility for the collective good of society. Um, we're going to take no responsibility for you know upholding uh, any norms or or, or institutions. Um, and so you know, again, this is what makes this such an incredible moment because there's no doubt that when you have the people that used to run the system or used to be part of running the system or used to be the majority now doing everything to tear down the system, right? Because they rather think of themselves as victims and, and minorities. Um, that will again, hasten the demise of this cultural, social, political, economic order. Um, and that makes it even more the case that these are obviously times of great danger. Because again, there's people that want something worse than, than even the, the exploitation and you know um, suffering under capitalism, but it means that the like this is an historical moment that comes around once or twice every millennium, right? When when we literally, with the choices we're making on a daily basis, are 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 pushing all of humanity in one direction or another at this at this kind of piv pivotal moment, um, and so uh, yeah, that's. That's really, I mean, at, at the heart of revol revolutionary thinking means not getting stuck in victim and not just getting stuck in what's wrong with this system. Um, though that's important to understand how this system works and what's wrong with it, but ultimately it has to be about what can we do to, to create a new system without a blueprint, without a blueprint. And if we are moving away from victimhood, um, I'm just thinking what might fill that space. And a question came up um, in terms of, quote, embracing the idea that we are the leaders we've been looking for, end quote, what are moment specific ways one can step forward and become an active participant in their community rather than a passive observer? Yeah, so I'll just say two things quickly on that. I mean, one is, you know, um, there's, Obviously, again, there's a lot of victimization going on. There's exploitation, you know, there's assaults, there's dispossession. So it's not to deny that these crimes, you know, against humanity are happening, um, but there is just so much within the American radical tradition um, that, that has been about refusing to, to accept victim status, right? That, that we're challenging the oppression. And you can see this in Malcolm X, you can see it, you know, in black feminism, you can see it, you know, in, in some ways in the disability rights movement and so on. Um, the, um, the second part of it, uh, which I was about to get to, <laughs> what was the second half of your question? I'm sorry. The, the second half of my question was, how can we step into the moment now um, and become right. an active participant rather than a an observer, like how do we yeah. embrace this two-sided transformation idea? So this is really key. This is where the visionary organizing concept is really important because when we are in a model of protest and rebellion or simply thinking that we're gonna change the leaders in power, that's when people think, you know, well, everything should be focused on bigger demonstrations or just everyone voting more, that, that, these, that these very formal ideas of politics where you step outside of what you you stop what you're doing to go vote, or you stop what you're doing, you put your kids in childcare so you can go run a community meeting. Sometimes that has to happen. Obviously, you know, people don't vote, you know. Um, but the point about organizing is it shouldn't be separate. Organizing is most transformative when it's not taking us away from our daily necessities, which is most of us don't even have time to do, right? Um, but it's actually addressing how we live on a daily basis. That's why I was talking to Migra about the midwife model being more important as a metaphor for creating a whole new system, but actually like as an actual way of thinking about the fact that we live in a system where capitalism and the expertise you know, of patriarchy has taken away the wisdom that came from communities and, and the folk and was so much embodied in women. That's why all the writings you know, on, on, on in, um, um, uh, witches and so on is, is, is linked to sort of modern capitalism. Um, but this is what's happening. When people relate the organizing to people's needs for education, for housing, and it's not that we're just voting to get the government to give you more of that, but we're creating these participatory models of freedom schooling, of cooperative housing, you know, of cooperative work, 
of neighborhood uh, organizing, community gardens, shared leadership, all these things that relate to, you know, if you've been in education, a Frarian approach to uh, uh, pedagogy and learning that's dialogical, that's collective, that's communal. So much of that, again, you can find some of this if you know read about you know the Bolshevik Revolution and the idea of the Soviets, you know, versus just the role of the state. But it's not just a Marxist or, or socialist idea. It really is part of a, a, a radical democratic idea that 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 cuts across so many different movements and societies. And that's what's that's what's really important. The idea there's always going to be some role for you know professional organizers who who do this full time, but most of the transformative change setting in comes from people incorporating these values and practices into the things they do on a daily, daily basis to survive, right? Um, and, and, and to grow, again, the childcare work, the healthcare work. So that's a real big part. So when, when Grace talks about healthcare, because obviously healthcare is like the number one issue, you know, for the Democrats running uh, against the Republicans. As Grace said, that addresses the issue of health insurance. It doesn't address the issue of health care. And care cannot come just from a system. You can gain access to uh, 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 health care if you have insurance, and a system can give you more access to insurance. But it doesn't mean the education or the health care of the child you get is radical or revolutionary or nurturing our souls, right? Um, a lot of education is simply, you know, um, training people to fit into the global capitalist system. And so we really need to think more about the care we're getting for our health, for our children, for our education. And again, that can happen with these local models of, of participation um, that start with the things people are already doing and food justice and other things, because we all eat, right? Um, there's ways in which we can, trans that we can transform what we do on a daily basis to survive. And those are the most radical transformative changes. And those are the things people can do without having to stop caring for their kids or feeding themselves or paying their rent, right? Um, in order to be a professional activist. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Like just rethinking what you're already doing and find ways to revolutionize that. Mm -hmm. and, and really the thing about capitalism, really the brilliance of it, the, the evil of it, is that it's forced all of us, not just as workers have to sell our labor to survive, you know, to, to the bosses, but every, I mean, neoliberalism is like literally taking everything from dating to eating to, you know, childcare to what you do with, you know, your car when, you, when you're not driving somewhere. <laughs> like they've monetized and financialized and capitalized and, and, and commodified all of that, right? So this young, this generation, your generation, the one that comes after it, only knows a world where, where capitalism has already invaded and, 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 and colonized every aspect of our being. But that also means that these points of resistance to capitalism are now everywhere, right? Swiping left instead of right or whatever it is. This is like all new to me. Like, these are now political acts of resistance, right? But again, there are limits to it, right? So when we all switch to Lyft, because Uber's guy was, you know, on Trump's whatever policy council, like that was an act of resistance, but that was a that was a kind of um, that was a low level act, right? Of kind of slacktivism. And now what does it mean to go beyond just that resistance to thinking, okay, Lyft is maybe slightly better in Uber at one time, but how do we change our whole model of transportation to decommodify it, making more about collectivity and equity? Okay. So first, thank you to our host, Dr. Scott Kurashige. Um, this was such a treat and a real blessing to be able to enter the text with this type of depth and nuance and complexity. So we thank you so much for hosting this virtual book club. And the wisdom does not stop there. Um, Asia Society is presenting um, one of Scott's upcoming lectures as part of our three-part series called Hacking the Syllabus Critical Solidarities, which looks at building intersectional solidarities. So he will be giving the lecture on December 11th, and this is a virtual event. So we invite all of you to join. His lecture is titled Representation to Revolution, What Asian American Studies Can Teach Us About Systems of Oppression. And then following the lecture, he will be in conversation with Adrian Marie Brown. So again, that's on December 11th, 
I will share a link to that event in the chat and you are all invited. And then I just wanted to say thank you quickly to two critical groups that made tonight happen. I want to thank deeply our moderators for holding space for discussion tonight. And then also to my Asia Society colleagues, Cooper and Tiffany. And lastly, thank you to everyone who participated tonight, who came out and joined us. If you're interested in getting involved in future book clubs in a deeper way, or if you have any feedback on tonight's event, please contact the email in the chat and I'll drop that in the chat. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great night.